Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Jason here from AV Pro Global. Today we're going to have a great webinar with audio Gramont, uh, with Anthony Gramani. We're going to be covering some basic things around audio 101. We're really just kind of teaching you folks uh, and, and getting everybody involved in the conversation of what makes a good audio system, certain things we're going to look for when we're building an audio system, and certain things we're going to, we're going to look for during the installation, and uh, just some kind of general tips and tricks around audio, around room setup, speaker setup, and things like that. Again, my name is Jason with AV Pro Global. And uh, we've got a couple a couple slides here that we're going to go through first. Uh, just real quick, the uh, AV Pro Global brand, if you guys are new to the company, thank you so much for uh, checking out our webinar series. If you guys have uh, been to our webinars before, been to these sessions before, thank you so much for returning. I do see some familiar faces and names in the uh, attendee box here, so thank you guys for, for coming back. Uh, during the presentation today, uh, we will have the question box open. Uh, this is meant to be sort of an open conversation, and uh, we'd love to hear some questions from you guys as we go through the presentation here with Anthony. Uh, from AV Pro Global, we've been around since about 2011, uh, starting off in the uh, testing and uh, measurement back with the testing and measurement background. Our CEO, Jeff Murray, he's been in the electronics industry for a very long time. Uh, between Jeff's experience in uh, electronics and Matt, our CTO's uh, drive and, and, and honestly just endurance when it comes to HDMI, uh, we started making some uh, test and measurement equipment several years ago, and that got us down the path of making extenders and um, eventually matrix switches and things like that. And here we are today in 2020. Uh, our goal as a company is really to make uh, products that are easy for installers to use, easy for installers to troubleshoot, and we like to provide the, the best support around. If you guys ever called our tech support department before, uh, we hear nothing but great things on our tech support team. So if you guys have any questions uh, out in the field or anything like that, if you're stuck on something, you're stuck on a job, uh, feel free to give us a call, guys. Uh, we try to make our sales available as uh, often as possible. We, we do have tech support now in the evenings and on the weekends and things like that. Then we also have our chat boxes on all of our websites available. So if you have any questions and you're surfing online, you have any questions about anything you see on any of the websites, feel free to hit up those chat boxes. We're happy to answer those questions for you at any time. My name is Jason. You guys have probably seen me on some of these sessions before. Uh, I've been doing this for, for a long time. I, I'm one of those lucky guys who have, uh, I, I do my hobby as a job. Uh, so uh, all, all this weekend, I hope you guys had a great weekend, by the way. Uh, this weekend, I was just watching movies and uh, playing playing around with a projector I've got in the house right now. and I uh, just uh, really, uh, really enjoying that uh, that 235 screen so far. It's been super cool so far. Um, I've been with the company now for about three, three and a half years. I uh, started off as a customer, actually, uh, doing calibrations in the field and using radio test equipment. And, uh, you know, the stars aligned and everything worked out, and I was able to come on board a few years ago, and things have been great since then. Uh, we have uh, we teach classes all over the country and all over the world, whether it's uh, the AV Pro Academy class, the ISF class. Uh, we partner up with a couple of other companies as well, like the Professional Video Alliance to teach video classes, the Home Acoustic Alliance to teach some audio classes as well. So if you guys are interested in taking any of these live classes uh, at any point, uh, feel free to visit our training website, avpro.training, and you'll see uh, you'll see the different classes that are available there. And eventually, uh, we'll get some uh, some dates and, and locations posted up there too uh, once uh, once everything gets back to normal. So what we're going to cover today with Anthony, just a few things to get you guys uh, kind of prepped for what we're going to look at today. Uh, this is going to be like an audio 101 course. So uh, just some of the basics around room shape and size, uh, the things that can hurt you, the things that can help you, uh, where the seats should go. Uh, we want to do things like eliminate standing waves, which we'll get deep into with Anthony here in a little bit. Uh, screen size and placement, where does the screen go and how big it should be? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, these are all going to be dictated by uh, where we sit, how big the room is, and things like that. Uh, speaker selection, another big important thing, uh, different types of music, what you're going to be using the, the speakers for, that's going to make a difference in what speakers you choose. Uh, speaker placement, where do the speakers actually go? Where does the subwoofer go? This is a huge topic. I think we can probably actually have a whole entire session, session uh, just on subwoofers and, and bass and, and things that can happen in the room when it comes to those really, really deep notes and those long waves. Uh, just generalized acoustics, so sound, sound isolation, noise control, uh, what are noise reflections, how do we get rid of the reflections? Uh, decay times, things like that. Again, we'll cover this in depth with Anthony here today. Acoustic treatments, uh, what kind of treatment should you be using? Uh, where should they go? Uh, that's a huge thing today in, in uh, building, especially building a dedicated home theater room or dedicated two channel room. And we want that room to be uh, nice and quiet, but we also want to have some reflections in there as well. So where you put the treatments, what the treatments are made of, everything matters when it comes to this type of stuff. And then we'll probably get into a little bit of the calibration basics when it comes to audio. Uh, you know, how loud should the speakers be? Um, you know, uh, setting up test tones, um, you know, setting up 
delay times and things like that. We're going to get into that very, very deep here with Anthony as the day goes today. So uh, our special guest today is Anthony Grimani. He's been in the audio industry for over 35 years, formerly of Dolby and THX. He's built some award-winning theaters. Uh, he's really just a, a, a legend and a guru in our in our field. I'm so glad to have him here today. He's been teaching CD classes for, I think, I think Anthony said 30 years. So lots and lots of experience when it comes to these things. Uh, he has a couple of companies that he's working with right now uh, in building up uh, Grimani Systems, PMI Engineering, Dimension 4. Um, I do have some contact information for you guys at the end of today's webinar uh, with my information and some AV Pro information and also some of Anthony's uh, contact information as well. So with that being said, Anthony, uh, are you there and can you hear me? I am here and I can hear you. Can okay, you hear great. me? Yes, let me stop sharing my camera and my screen and you should have control. Do you have control over the, can you share your screen now and go ahead and fire your camera up. Okay, uh, let's see. I generally have no control, but let's see. Um, so my camera looks like it's on. Can you see me? I can see you. And if you give me okay. just a moment here, you should be able to see me. And oh, there's already a question box. That's awesome. Uh, okay, you can see me? I can see you, yeah. Okay, fantastic. I can see you and I can also see your screen, which is fantastic. So how are you doing, Anthony? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, Good. Interesting and, and fun and strange times, but I'm yeah. overall doing great. Family's healthy. Everybody's good. So Good. I, I'm I, much the same for everybody else. Yeah. I um, It's warm here in Florida. It's about 82 degrees. It was about 88 yesterday. We took a walk and uh, it was a bit warm out. Is it, is it warm down there where you're at? Uh, it's really warm here. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Sioux Falls got some snow over the weekend. They were they were uh, some of the folks up at headquarters were sending me pictures. They got they got a bunch of snow dumped on them. So very very all over the place right now. Yeah, is that normal? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, exactly. It's exactly. The, the weather seems just about as strange as uh, as the the worldwide worldwide health situation. So right, exactly. Um, yeah. Anthony, we, we've actually got a uh, we've actually got a question in already from Chris. Um, uh, it, it sounds like he's just kind of giving you a shout out, actually. He says, uh, Chris says, hi, Anthony, you're the reason I've been infected with the home theater THX virus. My first receiver when I was studying in Frankfurt back in the 1990s was the Onkyo Integra TX SV919 THX was the first ever THX consumer receiver, I think. So Chris says hi, and uh, he's uh, he's blaming you on his uh, his uh, love for, for his audio system. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Yeah. Good, good. So we got a lot to cover today. I mean, uh, this is... Um, uh, this is such a fun topic to me. I, as much as I'm into video, and I know we've talked about this offline, but uh, as much as I understand video, I'm really an audio guy at heart. Um, I started off as a young kid listening to headphones and big stereos, and I'm really into music. And so anytime I get to talk to somebody uh, with your level of knowledge and background when it comes to audio, um, I feel like I'm taking the class myself, you know, because I, I have tons of questions and, and I love this stuff. So thanks for being here, and I'm super glad to have you. Well, it's fun. It's a good time to be doing this. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I think. You know, not to talk too much about what's going on worldwide, but I'm realizing that with the generalized slowdown, I started to look back at all of the stuff that I parked. Like, okay, I'll deal with this later. I'll read right. this book later. I'll go through this thing later. Now, now's the time, and yeah. I'm, I, I feel like I'm busier now than in the normal day with all kinds of catch up, which is yeah. good. This is sure. a good time to be doing sure. this. Take advantage of the available energy and time to do some learning and teaching and exchanging. So, awesome. I'm I'm glad you guys are giving me an opportunity. I'm glad we could do this in part. Great. This is great. Well, speaking of energy and time, that is going to lead us into our audio discussion today. Absolutely. Um, I know you've got uh, you've got some stuff um, ready for the folks to kind of look at here when it comes to some PowerPoint slides and things like that. And I think uh, after our last session that we had, uh, you and I did that um, session on uh, just building a modern 4K theater uh, with John Tumbleson on as well. Uh, we got some great right. feedback from that. And a lot of folks really like some of those slides. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what you've got for us today and, and to just talk to you about um, some of the things that we talked about at the beginning. Great, beautiful. Cool, good, good. Um, so uh, let's see, what, what do you see right now? On the, on I've the got screen? both of our cameras and your PowerPoint. Excellent, excellent. So I am going to do a very quick summary using slideshow. Is that gonna do that? Okay, great. So uh, first off, I, I definitely wanna thank you and the guys at AV Pro. Um, and, and explain to the folks out there, I think there's about 100 people watching or listening, um, you're, you're doing this out of the love of, of teaching and sharing. Um, you know, there isn't that, that uh, you know, that you guys aren't going to sell anything directly from everything I'm going to talk about for the next year and I, uh, next year, the next hour. And I think that's absolutely admirable. 
Um, so big shout out to you guys for dedicating the time and energy rather than sure. spending the time talking about how great your power supplies are or how great right. your input and outputs are, and instead just uh, wanting to build some, uh, you know, raise the bar in the industry, build some trust and, and yeah. help educate people so that when we all get out of this, we're all better at what we do. Sure, sure. And, and that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thanks. We, uh, you know, we, we take a very, very, uh, 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 we take education and, and training very seriously. And it was one of the reasons why uh, when I came on with the team, I was so excited because, um, you know, we wanted to build this training program from scratch. We wanted to educate people about the audio video industry and about things like what we're doing today. So yeah, I appreciate you, uh, you calling that out, man. That's, that's cool. We're, we're, we're big on the education part of it. And this is really, um, uh, really our passion and, and really why we wanted to have you on because I we yeah. know you feel the same way Great. Well, you got the sound power like I like to say <laughs> <laughs> Cool, cool. Um, and, and real quick guys for, for those of you who are watching the webinar if you take a look at your screen um, You can um, you can make Anthony's PowerPoint screen bigger or smaller uh, There should be a slide bar uh, in between this Anthony screen and our two cameras and If you grab that slide bar with your mouse and slide it up and down You can make his screen bigger or our cameras bigger or whatever you want so just a tip out there, if you guys are having any trouble reading his screen, you can make it bigger if you need to. Uh, and again, I am watching the question box, guys. So feel free to type in any questions you might have uh, during the presentation. And, and just out of curiosity, I also pulled up the feed of this webinar on my iPhone. Um, oh, cool. And I, I noticed that there that you can slide just, just by grabbing the, the display, slide back and forth between the PowerPoint and uh, our, our two faces. So sure. Perfect. if you're uh, tired of looking at us, uh, slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that would not blame right you. You'll see. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's get into this. Um, actually, first a little bit of introduction on on what it is I'm doing these days with Romani Systems. Uh, launched a speaker company. What is it? After 30 years of doing this stuff, I just decided, okay, you know, there there is a better way to get get sound power. There is a better way to enter the world of ultra high definition sound. And uh, I'm not going to talk hardly at all about that here, but just. Um, Look, look at the website, Gromani Systems, um, and it's it's largely about just making your life easier and getting really good quality sound and uh, and be able to integrate it better and easier, monitor it, uh, do, do all the modern things that sound systems should be. Okay, enough said. Um, so this is the outline of what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're, we're going to actually in a chronology of how to put, how to design, put together, install, and tune um, an audio system for a good home cinema. You would start with the room size and shape, whatever's available. Either you're starting on paper or you're given a room uh, to work with and uh, you have to figure out how to, how to best use its shape. Uh, within that room, we're going to figure out what the seat placements need to be for ergonomics and standing wave uh, to reduce the audibility of standing waves, I should say. Then you're going to figure out what screen size you can put in there. Um, and then after that, you're going to talk about the speaker selection. A lot of people I talk to start off with, oh, we're going to build a room, we're going to start with a speaker. It's like, well, have you engineered every other thing before you decide what speakers you're using? It's like, no, we, we want to use a speaker. Understood. Maybe you like the speaker, but maybe it's not the right thing for the room. Maybe it is. Well, let's engineer things uh, before that. Um, then after we select the speaker, we're going to talk about where to place the speakers, and we're going to talk about where to place the subwoofer. And then we're going to look at the basic acoustics relative to sound isolation, noise control, reflection, decay. I'm going to spend a little time on the last part of that, which is uh, how to how to figure out the proper reflection decay character and, and picking the right treatments and where to place them. And finally, the calibration. So we're going to do all of that in 45 minutes. I'm going to talk fast. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness this thing is being recorded, and I think you're going to put it on YouTube later, right? Yeah, great, great point. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, guys, this will be recorded, and uh, we'll we'll pop this one onto YouTube um, after after the session today. So uh, yeah, if you do have to jump off for any reason, no worries there. Uh, you can always catch it up on the on the recorded YouTube video later. Beautiful. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk fast because uh, really what I this slide. Let's go back. This actually should take a full day. I mean, oh sure. This is a good thing to, to take a full day to talk about. We're going to just skim over stuff in 45 minutes. So let's jump jump into it. First of all, uh, about the room size and shape, that has to do with what your seating is going to be and what the standing wave characteristics are going to be. So first of all, you may be working with an architectural plan. If you're lucky, either as an end user or as a um, uh, as, as an integrator, if you're lucky, you're actually going to be uh, given a, an architectural plan, and if you're lucky, you can actually alter it and modify it and update it so that it works right. Um, and based on that, uh, actually, and if you're not, you just have to work with the space that's there. 
based on, on that, you may or may not be able to put as many seats as you were hoping to do. You can't put 20 seats in a room that's 13 by 12, uh, unless every one of your friends is my size, which is midget. Um, so a after that, you're gonna wanna look at the licked and width ratios and, and uh, make sure you have the, the right characteristics for immersive sound and picture and the right length with height ratios for standing waves. So let's look at the first thing. Um, ideally, I found uh, after doing at least one of these theaters, uh, probably about a thousand formally in the last 20 years, and I don't know, another three or four or 500 the, the 10 or 15 years before that. I found generally that rooms that are in generally not square, square is wrong, we'll talk about why later, but rooms that are not too long, uh, that are kind of squarish, somewhere in the, in the length to width ratio of 1.2 to 1.4 are good overall for both sound and picture immersion. So everybody's into, into immersive audio, of course, these days, which is you know what Atmos and DTSX and all those things are called. But you, you ultimately, when the whole experience is put together, you want to feel like you're in this bubble of picture and sound. If the room's really long, it's hard to get that to happen. Um, if it's square, more squarish, things come together better. And here's an example of a room we're just working with right now. I think I just finished calibrating this uh, about three weeks ago. Um, and it's, it's a room in which the length to width ratio is 1.38, um, and it works really well. The, the, the position of the seats, uh, over here, there's, there's actually two main rows. Uh, Jason, can you see my mouse shaking up? And yeah, down? I, can, I can see your mouse also, and if you want to, uh, there is a tool over here for like a laser yeah. pointer, but I can see your mouse just fine. Uh, real quick, uh, somebody just chimed in and said no audio. I can hear your audio fine, and nobody else has said that. So, guys, let us know real quick if you have if you can hear us or not. Maybe Hartman, maybe you're just having a problem on your end. Okay, everybody else says sound fine. So, Hartman, check your check your mic and 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 uh, headphones and whatnot, and. Uh, yeah, see, see what may be going on on your end, but we're good. Okay, so Anthony, keep going. Go for it. <laughs> These webinar programs have a ton of little controls. Jason and I actually just spent a half an oh, hour yeah. working yeah. about audio because there's a control here and a control there and a control there and a control here and a control there. And <laughs> <They're> everywhere. <laughs> um, should be easier. Anyway, so let me actually try uh, There you go. This. There's a nice big uh, laser, laser spot. Uh, so now that I did this, I, you know what, I'm going to have to get back out of here, get back to my presentation. Go back to the laser spot. Ink, ink. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, let's see. You know what? I can't actually run both at the same time. I love it. Okay. Oh, well, that's okay. We can see your uh, your mouse pointer okay, too. Right. Anyway, too. so um, in this particular room, there's two main rows of seating, and then there's an auxiliary bar row with tall stools. Works and, great. And I'm sorry, real quick. Go ahead and share your screen one more time. I don't see your screen. Share screen. It is now shared. Okay, perfect. There it is. There it is. I have lost where I was. We'll go back right over there. here. Hit all the right buttons. Can you so, see? Now you're beautiful. Perfect. Back in action. This mouse is not exactly very big. But anyway, so um, uh, two rows of seating, main rows of seating. There's a there's a theater row. There's sort of a chaise lounge row. Actually, French is chaise longue, long chair. <laughs> Um, and and these are all set up in a way that speakers are surrounding the audience. There's these the front speakers, left, center, and right. There's the side speakers over here, two sets of them to to have good and even coverage for the front row and the back row. There's a set of back speakers over here. There's also a set of really important for immersive audio, what I call the wide speakers. These actually complement the sound field between the front and the side to fill in the hole that's naturally here. So when you have a sound of a car that starts on screen goes to the left of the screen and, and then goes down the wall, that speaker carries a channel which is created by the sound designer to help fill in the sound. It goes from that, you know, it may, it may start in center, then go to the left, go to the wide left, go to the side, and then go to the back. Without that, we have a proverbial sound field hole. Filling it in is, is good. Now, these are not exactly in a circle around you. That would be the ideal world, but then you end up with some room problems. Instead, they're a fairly good circle. By setting up the distances and delays in the calibration process, you'll make it sound at the main seats like the speakers are all arriving at the same time. But there's a there's a they're reasonably uh, there's a reasonable layout of of uh, sort of circular directionality to this whole thing. 
Um, same thing for the video. So in this room, we have a we have a pretty big screen that actually uh, gives you a coverage of 69 degrees at the front row, 47 degrees at the middle row, and 40 degrees at the back row. This is sort of ideal as a visual angle, as a extended angle for 4K video. If the room was really narrow and long, you'd have big differences between the front, the middle, and the back, and that's not so good. So trying to square up the room a little bit just gets all the, the viewers closer to the same experience of a big, nice, immersive picture. Uh, just and I were talking earlier about how 235 pictures, 2.35 to 1 pictures, just have this magic to them, and they do. And as uh, you know, if you can cover about 50 degrees of your field of vision, and then realize that your normal field of vision is sort of this rectangle that's 2.35, which is why movies are shot that way. You end up with an incredibly immersive character. You feel like you're in the movie within seconds, and it's great. So uh, overall, length to width ratio, somewhere around 1.2 to 1.3 works great for a consistent image. Now, here's another room uh, we just finished design, uh, working with. The, the wall locations were given to us by the architect and builder this is an existing house. We got involved in the remodel. It is what it is. Um, given the same length of room, look at this. It's a lot. It's a lot less wide. And the the actual ratio of this room, the length to width, is about 1.8 to 1. We still have three rows of seating. Um, there's a front row over here of a uh, of uh, theater seats. Uh, it got a little obscured over here, but there's a second couch row behind here. And then in the back, oh, I'm sorry. So then the back, there's actually ga a gaming station with a stable. Um, but the, the, the listening angles are, are not really that consistent. If you look at the distances to the front speakers versus the side speakers versus the back speakers, they are different. And even though you can do digital delay to make these appear further, your brain always still knows, yep, yeah, these are closer. Even if in the arrival time relative to the other ones, you can form images, it still doesn't give you that nice immersive character. And then for the, the picture size over here, when we have 51 degrees at this row of seating, there's 30, 36 degrees at the back row. It's not very consistent. So generally speaking, just for the sense of immersion, uh, try as much as possible to go for uh, about one point, somewhere between 1.2 to 1.4 length to width. That doesn't have anything to do with acoustics and standing waves. It just has to do with the sense of being in the room and it all work right. Now, Anthony, Anthony real quick, is, is, is length and width we talk a lot about, but what about uh, the height of the room or the height of the ceiling even? Is that, is that going to any of these calculations, or are you just primarily worried about length and width at the so very right, beginning, early stages? Right. Now, for, first step is length to width, so that, so that if you're given a plan by an architect who doesn't really understand what we're into, they just go, yeah, I want a room, I'm going to put four rows of seats, and the room is 15 feet wide and 50 feet long, mm -hmm. which is a room I'm actually just working on. Wow. Just and I'm trying to convince everybody, you know, we got to do something different. Yeah. But if you're doing that, you should know that, that you're going to be challenged to make that work. And what I mean by make that work is end up in the end, when you're done building the whole thing, you know, a year and a half later, when you're done with the construction and you're in there trying to tune in and trying to get to that, that, uh, that nirvana, you know, people use that word a lot, but that's sure. that, Wow, man, I'm totally surrounded. I feel like I'm in it. But, you know, you're just not going to get there. And you're going to be tweaking and tweaking, try to adjust and try to get the thing to work. And it's just, it's going to be a fight. Right. So right at the beginning, if you can let the person who's deciding what the length and width of this room understand that, you know, it'd be better if this thing was more squared up. And if you can't make it any wider than 15 feet because there's foundation walls over here, well, can we just shrink the room? Can we make just make the room, I don't know, 18 feet long? Um, and then have a, uh, maybe a bar area or a separate room at the back side of that that's, that's kind of the, the, uh, the entrance lobby. You're going to put the drinks in the refrigerator and the, the candy machine, machine and yeah. the yeah. all of it. Yeah. So that's room making noise. And some people go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. I love the idea of having the lobby. We'll put posters and all this stuff. And some people go, no, I want the whole room. And then your responsibility as a, as a consulting dealer, because you are consulting, you know, you're selling there, you're selling, but it all starts with consulting. Your responsibility is to tell them, okay, great, but you need to know that in the end, you may not get exactly what the film director, the, you know, all of the envelopment that you've heard in our demo room, for example, and you may want to actually write an email, this is my fingers, write an email to the architect, the client, and all parties concerned that this may not work out right. So yeah. that but even a half later, when the client says, nah, I don't know, it doesn't quite work right. You know, I'm not happy. It's like, oh, you know, 
let me bring up this email that I wrote a year and a half ago where, you know, I was concerned about that. And we decided to move forward and it is what it is, right? Okay, thank you. Um, that also keeps the lawyers at bay in case that it. Oh, yeah. That um, sounds like uh, some of the rooms I run into sometimes where they, you know, the customer wants to paint the theater walls yellow or something. And you're like, well, you can, but it's going to have all these negative effects, right. you know. Right. You try right. to warn them up front as much as you can. You know, I, I tell people in ISF and AV Pro classes all the time, I'm like, guys, we're, you know, we're not only there just to put a bunch of boxes and hang TVs on the wall. We're there to also teach the customer the best way to do it. So right. I love that you yeah. include the, you know, what, what you're saying about consulting the customer. That's, I love it. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no time like right at the beginning to, to set that record straight. Right. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the next thing, which is a real an unbelievable pain in the you know where with rooms that are designed for for actually music and film it's particularly a challenging for a challenge for film because film sound relies a lot on low frequency um, and this thing called standing wave resonances that i've got up on the screen right now can make the difference between incredible success in the theater and a complete failure um, the reason i talk about this and i'm going to spend a fair amount of time on this um, is that it, there's basically nothing that makes a, a client happier in the beginning than, than good, strong, powerful, punchy, I feel it all over my body days. Right. Um, and, and they're just, you know, the minute you first start a demo and things are just going, <laughs> they're going to go, oh my God, that's amazing. I can feel it. Yeah. Then they're going to get over it and then they're going to be, if the dialogue's not good, then they're going to be like, I can't understand what they're saying. That's the second thing that's important. And the third thing is you want good immersion and surround development. If you can get all three of these things to happen, there's my fingers, all three of those, you're going to have a happy client. Oh, and by the way, if it's easy to use and reliable, you have a super happy client. Um, yeah. So we'll, I'm not here to talk about that, but I, I do worry a lot <laughs> about the conversation. Yeah. So standing waves. Uh, standing waves, they happen when the room dimensions are equal to sound wavelengths. So I've got a... a, a um, a picture up here that shows a room seen from the top uh, where here's your client with the receding hairline just like that. Um, and and the speaker you know the whole speaker system it's simplified over here and here's a wave in which the length fits entirely within the room when it fits entirely in the room it resonates just like inside a pipe organ just like inside any instrument when it resonates there's places where the sounds going to be loud and there's places where it's going to be quiet and there's certain frequencies in which the sound's gonna hang for a long time because it's resonating, sometimes two or three seconds after you put the sound in there. And then there's other places where you'll have no sound. Now, um, standing waves are, they're called that way because uh, st standing waves actually don't just happen acoustics, they happen in, in all systems that can resonate, electronics, mechanical, et cetera. But they're called standing waves because they sit up and they stand in there. If you sit down, there are still standing waves, okay? A lot of people think that, like, in the zen of audio, if you hear a standing wave and you sit down, it goes away. Well, oh, maybe no. it does if it's a vertical standing wave. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's an introduction to, like, where you want to sit. But there, there it was in the room. Now, they don't just happen at the length of the room. They also happen when the room is, is uh, half the size of a wavelength. Uh, or one and a half times, or two, two and a half, up to three times. Uh, uh, once you fit enough waves in the room, usually the standing wave gain or or uh, efficiency goes down. So really, you want to worry about the the standing waves that are twice as long as the room, as long as the room, um, and maybe two or three harmonics up from that. Now, um, what they result in is resonances that result that that cause uneven frequency responses core bass impact, different bass at every seat, and in the rooms we're working with, you have problems somewhere in the range between 30 hertz and 150 hertz. Below 30 hertz, in most cases, the rooms are, actually the waves are, are that much longer than the room that there is no standing waves. Interestingly, you know, some people think that if the wave is much longer than the room, you don't get bass, and that's not true, um, because you would get no bass in the car if, if that were to happen. And yeah. some cars have incredibly good, tight, clean bass, um, and uh, that's because the base waves are actually about 10 times longer than the car, and at that point, you don't have standing waves anymore. So let's, let's look into this. Uh, let's, let's pretend we have a room uh, that has three sides, a, a front, a left, and a right, and you emit a wave in it, and then there's no back. The wave keeps going past you and disappears somewhere in the backyard. There, if there's no wall, there's no reflection. If there's no reflection, there's no standing wave. Now let's close up the back wall, and let's let the, the wave bounce back. 
And that wave that originally continued on back to the backyard is now confined, just like we're all supposed to be in, and comes back. Is that a problem? Well, so here's an interesting thing. I've just shown you one wave that starts from the left of the room at a certain pressure, and earlier had propagated in this way, actually. Uh, and this energy is actually what had happened earlier in time because it is now traveled further away from you. So sound propagates at about a foot per millisecond. It doesn't instantly just appear. It takes the time to propagate. Now, in reality, what I'm showing over here is a region of pressure of air. And sound is actually changing pressure with time. So when a woofer is pushing sound into the room, um, it energizes the pressure. It, so it compresses the pressure, expands the pressure, and goes back and forth, and your ear is sensitive to that. The pressure goes in and out and tells your brain that there's sound. Um, if I actually propagate this uh, diagram into how sound really is, which is it goes from a high pressure to no net pressure to a negative pressure back up and down. This is actually more of a real uh, representation of what sounds with this line up here being pressure. And then this being actually the propagation over time. You'll see that a wave that, that's here is preceded by this shape. A wave that's here is preceded by this shape. And as the sound goes to the other side of the wall and bounces back and does this, and then at another time, point in time, it goes over to this wall and bounces back, you end up with this funny butterfly shape. What the hell does all this mean? So, over here, there's a high change of pressure over time. That's at the place where maybe there's a speaker or subwoofer. On the other side of the room, all the way on the back wall, if this was the front wall and that was the back wall, there's a change of pressure over time. That means you hear it. And then look at over here. And then in this funny intersection where all of those waves kind of joined at a place where over time there's sometimes what's called a node. It's like the the middle of a uh, of a tie of a, of a bow tie. If you do a really good job, what happens over here? There is there's no change. There there's no up and down. There's no change of pressure over time, which means there's no sound. So in a room in which the wave is twice as long as the room, there will be high pressure uh, on one wall. There will be high pressure on the other wall, and right in the middle there will be no sound. And that no sound actually could be 40 or 50 decibels down from the pressure over here, which means the level here could be 1% of the level there, or half a percent or a third of a percent, which is not what you want. And um, does, does this explain sometimes why, if you're listening to a, a, a song or something with a lot of heavy bass, and you just walk around the room, parts of the room it's much louder, parts of the room it's like, where'd the bass go? You take a step left, oh gosh, the bass is back now. Yep. Does that kind of yep. explain that? So this could be one reason, and that's actually really interesting. And in, in another webinar we're going to do, I don't know, forget Jason now, if it's in two or three weeks, we're going to talk more about that. There are actually, when you're walking around, there's two effects you're hearing. One of them is standing waves. So there's places where there's these, these butterfly nodes and all this other stuff. Another effect is called boundary conditions, where it's a little different of a setup. The result is sort of the same, which is the base is gone. But um, it's a condition in which the sound hits the wall, mm -hmm. comes back, and intersects as a cancellation of the place. That's actually known as a, either a comb filter, a boundary condition, all. It's a null, it's not a node. Um, right. And you want to worry about both of those because ultimately what you want is really good strong base where, where you sit. So um, just to complete this little set of diagrams, and I know I'm putting a lot of time into this, but this is this That's is okay. stupid important in the design of a room. Yeah, um, no problem. If, if you take the same room um, and you produce a frequency that's a little bit higher, so it's a shorter wavelength, right? So let's look at this one, same room, and then, oh, and then now let's do a slightly higher frequency. So let's say the other diagram was 25 hertz or 30 hertz, and this one's 40 hertz. The wave's a little shorter. If you leave the back door open, like let's say you have, you have a room with, with huge opening doors into a patio, and she did a room like that in Hawaii, it was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say you do that, and then you close the door. This particular condition, the wave reflects back, and you can see that there is not this null condition right here. No matter where you are, there's always a change of pressure over time, which means there's sound. So this is a frequency slightly higher than before in which there's no standing waves. There could be a null from a, again, a boundary condition, which we'll talk about next time. All right, so 
Um, to make it more complicated, there is a standing wave in a room when the wave is twice as long as the room, and the result is that there's a knoll of sound right here in the middle. So this is actually the wave going in the room, and in blue over here is a representation of the, um, uh, excuse me, is a re representation of the sound level. So it's loud here, it's loud there, and it's quiet over here. I hope you guys are following that. Um, I'm gonna go back to this diagram. This diagram shows waves, and this change of, of altitude here, this change of, of uh, level represents sound level. This over here is trying to do the same thing. It's showing the wave, and it's showing the resulting sound level. So when a wave is twice as long as the room, there's no sound in the middle. Next up, what happens when the room is the same length as the wave? There is a null at a quarter and a null at three quarters. So when the wave is twice as long, there's a null at one half. Over here, there's a null at a quarter. There's a peak at a half. There's a null at three quarters. When the wave, uh, when you can fit one and a half waves in a room, you get a null at, at one sixth. You get a peak at two sixths. You get a null at three sixths, which is a half. And then you, you get a, a peak at five sixths. And then you get a null at five, excuse me, four sixths. I just realized there's a there's a mistake here. So one six, two six, this would be three six, which is one half, four six, five six, and then six six, which is the length of the room. So here there's actually three nulls in the room. And then finally, when you can fit two waves in a room, uh, you get more nulls, one at an eight, a null at three eighths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, usually in the rooms we're working with, we want to worry about these four conditions. And you'll see that if you're not paying attention, you could actually put a seat somewhere here, or you could put a seat somewhere here, and at those frequencies, there'll be no sound. So uh, let's take a look at that condition. So this is yet another representation of the same thing, showing a speaker on one side, uh, and the, the light color means there's, it's loud. The dark color means it's quiet. Light, light, light color, a bit of a tongue twister, but mm -hmm. it, light color sends it's, uh, says it's loud, then it's quiet, then it's loud, okay? So this is a condition in which the wave that's put into this room is twice as long as the room. There's a null here and a null there, one quarter and three quarter. If you put your seating area over here at this particular frequency, if this room's about 20 feet long, that would be around 50 hertz, there'll be no sound here, okay? That's a problem. Now, it doesn't, uh, by the way, the standing waves don't just happen from front to back. They also happen from left to right, right to left, and top to bottom. And the worst thing you could do in a room is either make it a cube, in which the resonances are the same from, from, all, from both directions and the top, um, or make it a condition in which the resonances in the front, the front to back and left to right and top to bottom are multiples of each other. So let's take a look at that. Here's the same room in which the dimensions are such that the standing wave, you fit a full wave along the front to back, and then along the width direction, you also have a null over here. In this condition, at this couch, you have a double whammy. Double whammy. So there's really no sound over here. That sucks. It's not going to be good. So overall, you want to calculate the standing waves. And the, there's equations for both the metric system and the antiquated uh, standard uh, relies on the, on the toes and feet and legs of kings, kings and queen uh, <laughs> imperial system. Um, that's my little dig for, hey, we should convert to the metric system. I, it's and, I've been saying that since I probably was in middle school. Like, this is so much easier. It's all 100s and 10s. Why don't we just switch? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's a lot easier. Um, so this is an equation where you can sort of predict the standing waves. And what you want to do is calculate all of them um, and then make sure that the frequencies are never the same between the length direction, the width direction, and the height direction. And, and um, you can do that, or you can download one of these calculators. RPG has a good one. Kara has... I can't know if this one's still around. I went looking for that the other day and couldn't find it. THX had a remote calc. Stereophile Guide to Home Theater had one. We designed one of our own. There's a whole bunch of different calculators for this stuff. This is what ours looks like. There's a whole bunch of numbers in there. It helps us figure out where there are problems. Um, and I got to warn you that the uh, legend of building a room non-rectangular doesn't work. There still are standing ways. are just different and hard to predict. And also, this is not recommended. So don't bother building rooms that are these funny shapes because they're still standing waves. You just can't predict them and you can't fix them. These um, are those, uh, those are those systems where somebody says, you know, I want to put a theater in my living room and you have zero control over 
anything at that point, especially if it's an odd shaped living room, which in Florida, we do have a lot of rooms that are angled a certain way and have weird angles on the ceilings and whatnot. So yeah, I can see that would be a, a big pain in the butt. Right. So uh, it's a pain in the butt in terms of predicting what they are. You can still fix them and we'll talk about the fixes later. So I also want to point out that there's there are several effects of standing waves, of course, in, in the audibility of them. One of them is you could sit at a place where there's no bass sound at certain frequencies and Murphy's Law said wherever you want to put the couch, you'll have a giant sec out between That's two and the big That's just completely normal. Uh, Murphy actually was an acoustician, and the people don't know that. Um, but the other thing is, in the places where you do hear the bass, it is resonant, so it'll hang out a long time. This is what's called a waterfall display. Um, and what I'm trying to show over here is that this particular resonance frequency, this is this is actually hanging out for about a second. So you put a kick drum sound in there, and rather than go boom, it goes boom. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be just some tight and punchy and clean. So. Um, so much for standing waves and seat placement and room sizes. Now, what follows naturally, um, and I don't have a lot of slides for this because I just want to wave my hands a lot um, okay. on this one. So the seat placement largely falls out of the work we just did. Uh, given a certain width of, of room and the size of your seats, there's only so many that you can put. Don't put them all the way on the outside. I, I often get these architectural plans that put a hole in the middle and seats far on the outside and the couch all the way on the back wall. Yeah, that may be great as a room for hanging out with your friends and drinking scotch whiskey, single malt, 22-year-old uh, Lafoy, which is my favorite, um, <laughs> some really dark chocolate. But it's not good for, for movies. Really what you want is all the seats in the middle of the room, correctly located with everybody as close as possible to each other, as long as they're all your friends and family that you know are not infected. Um, so um, the other thing in terms of placing the seats is, of course, place them where you can, and then make sure they're not in standing wave peaks or dips. And that's about all that I can say. If we had five hours, I could show you all kinds of diagrams and measurements and stuff. Now, how do you know not to put the seats on in the standing wave nulls? Do you calculate it, or do you measure it? Well, the reality, and this is the spoiler alert, all those things I just mentioned before with all of these diagrams, uh, nine times, uh, no, eight times out of 10. You know that 95% of statistics are made up on the spot. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this really only works for 70, 60 to 70% of the cases. In reality, standing waves don't follow these, these strict, strict rules because in the USA, the construction we have is relatively soft and pliable. Mm. The character of the base reflection of one wall versus the other versus the front and back are not completely consistent. So if you're building out of 12 inches of concrete all the way around you and there's a really heavy door, um, you will be able to predict the standing waves correctly. If you're building out of uh, relatively traditional modern construction, which is usually gypsum board, as it's known, also known as sheet rock, but it really should be called generically gypsum board on studs, whether it's wood or metal, um, with doors and windows, the flexing of the walls is gonna change all of this. And uh, there's a bunch of people that have written about this extensively. There's some really good work from Peter D'Antonio from RPG on this, great papers you can read about it. The fact is, after seeing all this, it's really hard to predict. And I need to let you know that just pulling up one of these Excel spreadsheets is not gonna tell you everything. So um, I just was looking at a giant bird just went by outside. And oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so ideally you wait a little bit until the room is built and then you go in there with measurement equipment and you actually take a look at where the peaks and dips are and maybe you slide the, the seats forward and back a little bit. That's the this is where your microphones and laptops start to come into play. Exactly. So microphones, laptops, measurement equipment, um, and even just your ears and the sine wave generator, something where you, you change the frequency manually by hand. You can buy little electric electronic boxes like uh, Goldmine used to make this really cool little battery operated thing, or you can use uh, uh, I, uh, smartphones, have programs you can put on them, computers have programs you can run on them to do that. And just check and see where the peaks and dips are or are not. Preferably, you don't want giant peaks and dips. All right, next thing let's talk about in the room is uh, screen size and placement. I know that this is a, a webinar on audio, but the, the screen size is going to affect also where you're putting your, your speakers and stuff. So I'll totally. just talk about it. Um, yeah, it's I'm funny you say that. It, oh, sorry. I was just going to say it, it's funny you say that because um, the size of the 235 screen I went with. Um, I had to be a little cautious with it because, you know, the wider I made the screen, the wider I had to put my speakers, and eventually I was going to run out of room. So I had to keep the 235 screen relatively small at 85 inches. Mm -hmm. 
I had gone wider, I could have gone wider, but then I would have had to put the speakers way out and it would have gotten in the, in the way of other things. Other things, yeah. So uh, the way around that is to do an acoustically transparent screen, just like right. they do in movie theaters. Ultimately, totally. what you want is your field of vision to be covered about 50 degrees worth, the subtended yep. angle. So from the left side of your eye to your head to the right, excuse me, left side of your vision, right side of your vision, that should be about 50 degrees. That's what film uh, directors of photography, directors of people involved in the picture are thinking you're seeing. And that's yeah. what you should see. And if you do that, the envelopment is good. You go much bigger than that, and um, you're going to run into resolution problems, even with 4K video. You're actually going to totally. start to see pixels. You're yep. going to start to see that the round elements are a little jaggedy. But you're also going to get to a point where you're, you're like, uh, your peripheral vision is so excited that you may actually end up with nausea. Yeah. So a, a good sweet spot is around 45 to 50 degrees. If you do that, and you use an acoustically transparent screen. There's a lot of companies now that make woven screens that are essentially like road cloth. You can then put the speakers right on the inner edge of the screen inside. You can end up with the right coverage of audio and everything works. Um, now, the other thing you gotta worry about, of course, in the screen, and this gets back to two things you asked about before, which is uh, ceiling, uh, ceiling height. Right. Um, and then where do you put the, speak the speakers is, you ideally want the screen to be right at the middle of your of your eyesight uh, always you know, for, for really really good uh two hours worth of enjoyment you want to be looking straight at horizon or slightly below that so the screen should be at that height and if you have two rows of seating the only way you're going to be able to do that and have sight lines is that the back row needs to be on a riser on, a, on an Absolutely. elevated platform and so it's amazing how often I'm, I'm talking with designers and architects that that they didn't consider that they put two rows of seating in the in the room and they just think that oh well we'll just raise the screen up so that the back row can see and yeah or just just tall people in the back or something like that <laughs> yeah, tall people put the kids in the front well don't yeah. put the kids in the front do not put the kids in the front if you have kids and you care about them don't put them in the front why because exposing your kids to two hours of really big eye movement is really bad for their brain that's all I'll say. If you want to look it up, look it up. It's, it, it, it puts them in a position of fear and adrenaline, adrenaline for two hours, which shuts down the blood supply to the brain and essential uh, or digestive organs, anything that's not essential for fight or flight. And that's, that's like doing this to their blood supply. Don't do that. Yeah. Put the kids in the back where the screen is smaller. I, it's like I'm sure you've never, ever heard that before. You should pay attention to that. So I have kids. I worry about them. Interesting. Um, that's cool. So, um, now, uh, enough said about that. The solution for this is a, a nice big screen, riser in the back, so the platforms and you can rise the, uh, put the back uh, listeners and viewers up above the heads of the people in front, and then use an acoustically transparent screen with three speakers across the front. Now, what do you do if you're not doing a projection system? What do you, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, now you've got some problems. So, um, and those problems can actually be, can be resolved but you, you may not be able to go as big as you may other want. So I'm just gonna mention this. Um, you can get to a point, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say something really, really important. Ideally, the angle formed by the left speaker, your head and the right speaker is somewhere around 45 degrees. If you go much wider than that, you can end up with a hole in the middle in terms of the sound stage. You end up with too much separation between left center and right and things start to fall apart unless you pick the right speakers. And unless you tow them in, unless you do some other things. If you if you have a really big solid screen, where are you going to put the center speaker? Well, you may have to put it down on the floor in front, all the way down there, and it's right. going to sound like this to the people behind you. Yep. Um, or you put it up high, and now you have the sound coming from the head, and it's just it's just not it's just not enjoyable. It doesn't yeah, they, work. You're watching somebody speak in the middle of the screen, but the sound's coming from almost above. It's it, it's disorienting. It's really disorienting. So. I, you know, what are you going to do? Sometimes the only thing you can do to make it work is go phantom center. It's an incredibly bad thing for me to suggest, but sometimes that is the least of all evils. So that leads me into speaker selection. So what speakers do you use in designing your theater? You want to look at sound pressure level. So how loud do you want to play? And the fact is that a little speaker with a five and a quarter woofer and a little one inch tweeter in a room that's 30 feet long is not going to produce enough sound pressure level for not overloading on a movie scene. And I see that way too often. I see these nice big theaters in which there's a big, thick screen and a little puny center channel on, in the front. And it's like, oh my God, that's like, like putting a, a, a very small Fiat 500 engine in your giant 
pickup truck that you're going to try to pull that big boat to go to the river with. Yeah. You're not going to get anywhere. So not a good idea. Not a good idea. So you want to figure out how much sound pressure level you need. Um, and there are ways to calculate that stuff. That's going to be a topic for another another session. You want to figure out what quality you want. And quality will have huge effects on price. I will say that there are some really, really well-designed speakers um, that don't cost that much. There's a few manufacturers out there that have made it an excellent job of producing maybe product in which the fin finish is not as beautiful. So who cares that, you know, that the wood is not perfect? Um, and that the... You know, some of the visual elements of the speakers are so good, but they put a lot of energy into the quality, the componentry, and the design. And I'm not going to mention any names over here, but there are, there are really good deals out there. Um, and then finally, really important is the coverage. So there are speakers that cover sound like this. They're, they're very directional. Uh, those uh, horizontal center speakers with two woofers and a tweeter, they tend to beam sound this way. I know it's counterintuitive, but they're not going to spread very wide because the two woofers are going to fight each other off axis. One's going to be closer to you than the other one, and they won't work in concert. It's kind of like a crew team in which you're not rowing together. Right. So you want to look at the coverage of the speaker, and the wider the coverage, the better the sound stage and the sound quality is going to be. And I'll just I'll just say that in starting our speaker company for mining systems, where all all of the energy is all that's not true. 85% of the energy has gone into the into coverage, coverage uniformity, that at all frequencies everywhere, the speaker is really wide and continuous with frequency. That's all really important. So when the speaker manufacturers are talking about dispersion, that's what they mean, right? The angle exactly. at which the sound or the, the energy comes right. out. So some speaker manufacturers talk about dispersion properly, and some of them only talk about dispersion at a few angles. And I'm trying really, really hard within the CD organization to create some, di some disclosure standards so that everybody discloses this stuff the same way, because what really matters in terms of speaker quality, more so than a diamond tweeter and all this like really esoteric stuff talk about, is, is actually what's called the sound power, which is the net energy going in the room. So this is a super short course on what you should look for in, in uh, the quality of a speaker. So smooth sound power at all seats is extremely important. There's a guy called Dr. Floyd Toole has made it his lifelong mission to prove to people that this is important and other stuff like, you know, expensive cables, expensive finishing, little tippy toes, all the stuff that, that you can obsess over is really way, 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 way down the list in terms of quality. So smooth sound power, which is the net energy going in the room and hitting the speakers is, is really important. Frequency response on axis and off axis are very important. So what is the, what is the uh, net, um, net level at all frequencies going directly from the speaker to you and from the speaker off bouncing or on the walls and coming back to you, all of which gives you a smooth sound power. You may as well have low distortion, but it's amazing what the human brain can tolerate in terms of distortion on program material. You, you, could, you could get people speakers that have two or three percent of distortion, and unless you really, really carefully listen to certain instruments or, or certain elements of sound, you won't even notice. Never hear it, yeah. you know, tones you'll hear. But it's amazing how forgiving we are to distortion. So manufacturers that obsess over distortion, well, it's good. It, it shows that they put some good uh, attention into the drivers and the amplifiers they're using. But it's, it's really down, down the line compared to these other things. Um, and then sound level capacity. How loud do you want to play? So there's a webinar coming up in a few weeks. It's going to be just how loud should it play? There is a reference level that the film director is planning for you to listen at and the equivalent an audio of how bright it's supposed to be. Uh, it's supposed to be 105 dB peak per speaker. A lot of people don't want to listen that loud. You have to figure out how loud you want to listen. So I'm going to show you this quick diagram. I'm looking at my watch going, where does the time go? Yeah, actually, and, and real quick, guys, um, we have about five minutes left uh, to wrap up the hour. Um, I know uh, I'm fine to go a little longer. Anthony, I think you said you're fine to go a little longer, too. If yeah. you guys have to jump off, I totally understand. Thanks, thanks for hanging out. But um, if, if we go a little longer, again, we're going to... Uh, record this and have it on YouTube. So if you have to jump off, jump off, it's no big deal. Uh, real quick too, uh, Sandeep asks a question. Um, Sandeep, go ahead and type your question in. He says, um, I have a question regarding upper bass traps like in the zone of 100 to 250 hertz. Since the wavelengths are about in the range of four feet or less, where do you recommend to place these? Is that something you want to tackle now or could, should we contact him afterwards? Um, so coming up is a discussion on, on acoustical treatments. Um, and I would probably say this, um, I try actually not to use the word bass traps because it's, it's one of those sort of weird words that people use and misuse and mis whatever. I call them bass absorbers. Um, 
I kind of call main absorbers things that work down to about three or 400 hertz below that base absorbers, and then you know ultra low base absorbers. But um, the standing waves of rooms are, are generally between 30 hertz and about 100 to 120 hertz. And uh, those tend to be mainly in the corners of the rooms. And that's where you want to put low frequency absorbers that are dealing with, um, with base uh, with standing waves. Uh, 100 to 200 hertz uh, don't usually pile up in the corners like standing waves do. They're a little bit everywhere. And so really what, what you want to do with those is put them on the front walls, maybe some on the side walls. Um, I love to actually put a, an absorption pit in the floor, which I skipped over in, the, I think, the diagram before. But um, if this was a room, uh, imagine this, if you can see this in the, the diagram. Uh, if I can actually get in early enough, I love to put a big, deep, six-inch uh, a hole here that I fill with dense absorption, maybe a little bit of a membrane on the top and make that a low frequency absorber. So good places to put these mid, mid base absorbers is front walls to catch the low frequency energy of these front speakers. This area is a nice open area. You can put some in the riser, you can put some on the back wall. They don't need to go in the corners is where, I, is where I'm going. A lot of manufacturers out there sell what they call base straps, which is big foam things that you put in the corners. They really they they don't really do much in the corners actually, not not yeah. a good place. I see some other questions in here too, guys. Uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll we'll get to the questions uh, at at the uh, at the end of the presentation here. Yeah, just re remember if you guys have to take off, as we're we're uh, we're YouTube or we're filming this, right, Jason? Oh yeah. Um, and so you'll be able to catch up later if you have to get going because you've got other things to do. I understand but you'll be able to catch up by looking at this in in YouTube. All right, let's talk about sound reflections in the room, then we'll take the questions. So. I just want you guys to be clear about this diagram. This is one that tends to blow most people where it's like, Jesus, I had no idea. So when you're listening to speakers in rooms, there is a direct sound from the speaker to your head. That's called the direct sound, the first arriving sound, first arrival, whatever you want to call it. It's the one that's going directly from the speaker to you. But only one sound, it's one vector of sound. And then there's sound that bounces off the sidewall. So most speakers have enough dispersion that at about 40 to 45 degrees, they're going to send about the same sound, depending on the speaker, but it's like five, between 500 hertz up to one kilohertz. They're going to send the same sound over here, same level, essentially, as the direct sound. And that's going to bounce off the wall and come back to you a little later, maybe a little quieter, because it's such a travel further. So you've got one direct sound here that's, that's loud, and then a, a reflected sound that may be, let's say, three or four dB quieter. You go, okay, well, whatever, it's quieter. Yeah, except that there's this many reflected sounds. So you have one direct sound that's the loudest, and then you have all these other reflected sounds, some of which are quieter by 10 dB, some of which are quieter by 3 dB, but all together, all these red arrows end up being two or three times louder than the direct sound. And most people had no idea. So at a typical seating distance in most rooms, even with some curtains and couches and some some um, carpets and stuff, you, you are largely listening to reflected energy, more reflected energy than direct sound. In fact, if you want to move forward in the room to where the direct energy is louder and louder, you'd have to get to six feet of the speaker before you're dominated by the direct sound. Or actually, I'm sorry, not dominated, before the direct and the reflected sound are the same. If you're four feet from the speaker, you're dominated by direct sound. So typically, you're going to see 12, 13, 14, 15, 20 feet away in a big room. You are completely dominated in terms of what goes into your ear canal, which you don't wear in these ugly headsets, your ear headphones. Uh, you're dominated by reflected sound. So you got to realize that reflections dominate, and the quality of those reflected sounds really matter. So when you're picking a speaker, a speaker system, you want to make sure you're picking something in which the dispersion, the the width of energy that bounces around the room and its character is every bit as good as the direct sound. And how do you know? How do you know, yeah? How, how do you like the dramatic pause? That's it. How, you, <laughs> yeah. how you're going to know. Well, like a, go ahead. If any. Sorry, my, my, I got to chime for another. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I laugh because this amazes me. If any of you guys work both uh, in the residential and commercial side of our business, and you look at the same speakers from the same manufacturers on the commercial and the residential side, on the commercial side, they give you all the off-axis responses, the polar patterns, everything you need to know to be able to know. And this from all the companies, be it be it JBL, be it, you know, you name it. 
they, they have all of those charts. You look at the spec sheets and they have all the stuff. You look at the same kind of speak in the residential sides and they give you dimension, price, power, weight, and that's it. That's it, yeah. So this info is available. You just need to go into the commercial side if the speakers are equivalent, or you need to keep pushing CDA to help me with this uh, this process of disclosure. So um, now we at Morani Systems, we developed this thing called the CSA Waveguide to enhance the performance essentially of mid-ranges and tweeters to make them just get, get a way wider dispersion. So um, that's what I call sound power. That's really important. Um, that's you know what it reminds me of? It, 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 that sound power phrase and just how it works almost reminds me of color volume. It's kind of this new thing, yeah. you know, and, and we're trying, we're, we're, we pretty much got our heads wrapped around it now, but at the beginning it was like, wait, color volume, what does that mean? That kind of reminds me of sound power, that's all. I love that you bring that up because I, I never thought of that, Jason. That is exa yeah. it's exactly the same, uh, the same experiential result, actually. Sure, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. People have been talking about sound power for years. I have I have a book by Harry Olson from 1957 that talks about how that's a good way to design speakers. It's still oh, cool. not a practice generally in, in speaker companies. There, there are some people that do a really good job of it and some people who do a shoddy job of it. Now, <clears throat> two ways to deal with this. One is you ask, I'm sorry, if you actually conceive the same speaker from the commercial uh, uh, flyer as the residential flyer, look at the commercial one, you'll see all this data. Um, if you can't find it, call the manufacturer and go, hey, I'd love to see your sound power response. And I'm going to show you some charts of what that looks like. If they go, we don't have that. Well, get a sample of the speaker, ask your rep for a sample, and listen to the speaker. Play pink noise in the speaker and just listen to it on axis. Move off axis and listen all the way to 60 degrees, this way, like that. Just, and listening to the pink noise, that, that sort of sound of rushing water, listen to how much it changes. If it doesn't change so much, go straight on axis to far off axis, you got a good speaker that when you put it in the room and turn it on and tune it, at the end of this whole process, when you're trying to produce this audio nirvana, it will work better. That's the way to do it. Uh, I have on the screen uh, a, a close-up picture of one of our waveguides in Gemini Systems. Again, this, I'm, I'm not trying to say, to be clear, we're not the only company doing this where there's like a small choir of folks that are singing this tune. There's other people also doing this. This is our recipe for doing it. We, we got a patent on this, but this is what everybody should be doing is worry about the sound power. Um, ultimately, seen from the top, you want the speaker to radiate really wide horizontally, maybe some vertical focus, but also the same response at all frequencies. So that's what's, what's important is to have a widespread at all frequencies, to have a, con that gives you consistent sound quality at all seats, the direct, uh, and the reflected sounds are matched, that sound power. It's a smoother sound quality. It is the holy grail in speaker design for two-channel and multi-channel sound. So um, those things can all be measured by new manufacturers. This is what Floyd Tool re refers to as the spinorama response. Mm -hmm. Manufacturers measure 70 different points around the waist, around the horizontal side of the speaker and the vertical side of the speaker. And then they display it in these charts that you should be asking for. Again, a, a commercial speaker or a pro audio speaker that's just uh, that's disclosing these things according to the AES standard that Dr. Floyd Tool really pushed forward will show you this. And that, that's a combination of curves showing the, the axial response, what's called a listening window, which is what's going towards the listeners, and then off axis responses. And you want to look for speakers that in which that does not change very much with frequency. So relatively so flat and relatively smooth. Smooth and flat and not a lot of change. So this is uh, our alpha speaker, our biggest, most badass one. The net sound power, which is a net energy going in the room, is essentially a carbon copy of the axial response that goes directly to you. It's turned down five or six dB. Little bit, little bit of a of an uh, altercation or whatever, little change over here, about three dB of error. Um, that's that's actually really good. There's a lot of speakers. Shit, I'll mention it. There's a lot of speakers from JBL that do very well with this too. There's a lot of speakers from a lot of other companies that do really well with this too. Um, just look for this. Uh, this is another one of our speakers. You can also look at the individual off-axis curves. This is for, for our Rixos series. You should be looking at this. You can also look at what's called polar responses that shows the change over frequency. This is uh, our beta speaker. You should be looking for this stuff. Okay. Other thing in picking speakers is I'm in, an incredible fan of powered speakers these days, or at least speakers that are not using passive crossovers. Passive crossovers are so the day before yesterday. They're so mm -hmm. old. They're from the they're from the 50s. Enough. Right. Gun. We should get over it. Amplifiers are cheap. Um, 
you should use good quality uh, active speakers. They work way better. Whether the amplifiers are actually built physically into the box, which is one ergonomic type of doing things, or if it's a dedicated amplifier outside, they, they should be amplified because you can do, as I see over here, you can do uh, the input, the crossover, all the delay, all the protection, all of that can be done in the active domain. You can have separate amplifiers for the, the high frequency, the mid frequency, and the low frequency. It's more efficient, it's more precise, you get more flexibility, you get better sound quality. Some manufacturers, like us and other people, uh, build in some added bands of EQ right into the speaker so you can tune the speaker to the room as opposed to tuning the surround decoder to tell the speaker to do something to correct the room. That makes more sense. You know, convoluted, yeah. just tune the speaker to the room. Sure. You're done. It's like shoelaces on a shoe. You know, you, you like tune the shoe to your foot so that it's nice and tight. Mm -hmm. so, that's, yeah, that's um, a good way. I like that, yeah. So it's just like a projector. You tune the projector to the room or, or right. a flat screen display, you tune it to the room. Um, and that tuning is about custom tailoring the speaker to the room or to the taste of the, of the listener. Okay. Um, there were some questions. I'll pause really quickly yep. and finish up the last two slides here. Yep. Uh, so let me back up here because there's a couple going back. Um, Chris says he'd like to also hear, this might be a separate conversation altogether, but he says this, uh, he would like to hear also about the Holy Grail Gramani System Cinema Ensembles with the CSA and tungsten impregnated urethane. According to CD Expo attendees, it was the best-selling speaker system a few years ago. Wow. Any comments on that? Um, I'd love to. This is not a Gramani Systems propaganda, <laughs> so uh, I won't. Um, That's okay. We're, we're, we're here to just do general education. Yeah. I'll say, you know, um, there's resources at the end. You, you'll see the website. Go take a look at the website. Email me. We'll talk about it. Uh, but you, there's a fair amount you can download. Thank you for the nice uh, nice comment, nice plug. Um, um, and yes, we do we do use tungsten impregnated urethane. I love saying that. It's about as sexy as it gets. Um, <laughs> yeah. As a cabinet, it's uh, it's a very cool material. Um, Manoj, Manoj, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but uh, he says if we have the option to build a room for home theater, what's the ideal size? If we have a choice of ratio, what should be the ratio? We kind of covered that at the very beginning, right? You said one point uh, one point two to one point four, right? You know, so again, two. Uh, actually, that's that's three things, uh, and I'll start backwards. And one he says also that's that's an eight seat theater. So okay. probably four and four. So st standing waves matter. So ratios that don't enhance standing waves. You can't get rid of standing waves. Impossible. They're always going to be there. It's just physics. It's just there. It's just, what you want is you don't want them to be super energetic and coincident so that there's a ton of them. Number one. Right. Two, you want the length and width ratio to be so that you're not in a really long, narrow room or not square. Somewhere between the two is 1.2 to 1.4. Generally works well. So you want to be considering those two things. Standing waves, and then the overall immer, uh, ratios. <laughs> oh, there you yeah. uh, there you go. Okay, so standing waves. It's funny. I love lecturing with a whiteboard because then I can just write whatever you I just want. Draw. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to go draw on the back wall of, of this room <laughs> and see how well that goes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think um, you're going to get your deposit back. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so so. Standing waves, there we go. So standing waves, uh, ratios for immersive audio and picture, and then how big of a room do you need for the number of seats? And that's exactly it. How many people are you trying to put in there? So eight people, two rows of four, right? So how big are the seats? So typically in, in the US, most people like seats for theater seats that are around 22 to 23 inches wide with arms that are six inches. So you add all that up. And then you want some aisles, ideally on both sides, and the aisles should be somewhere around 30 to 36 inches, which is uh, 80 centimeters to 100 centimeters. And then you want some room for a stretch fabric dress with acoustical treatments behind them, which I'm about to show some, show some drawings on that, or some pictures of that. And that tells you the width of your room. So add it all up and it's gonna all fit. It's a yep. very simple math to figure that out. So he I also asked, say, oh, great. sorry, this is, he also asked about heights too. Yeah, and so now the height, uh, uh, the height has to do with a, a few different things. One of them is standing waves. So there, you could actually have a height in which the standing waves vertically uh, add up uh, energetically with the width of the or the length, and you don't want to do that. You want the right height. But then you want enough height that you can put the screen at the right uh, position in the room. Remember, you, we're going to do a really big screen. 50 degrees is a really big screen, so it's really tall. The, the ceiling needs to be tall enough that you can put the screen where it needs to be w without getting in the way of the ceiling. 
and also so that you can put a riser on the back and people not feel like they're going to bump their heads. So all of that is relatively simple calculations, but you need to be considering that. So this is the point at which the des I say the design of a theater is actually kind of like uh, trying to juggle with about five or six different um, balls, you know, ball, plate, um, bowling ball, and a hot iron at the same time. And you're trying to keep all of that in the air, keep all of those things in mind, because everything you change is going to affect something else, and you need to be considering all of that. Good. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. So speaker placement. So uh, I'm going to have to go over this really quickly. I'm just going to say that the placement of speakers is two hours of conversation. Um, I'm just going to say that ideally, uh, the front speakers should be behind an acoustically transparent screen. The, the side speakers uh, that used to be called the surrounds, I call them side speakers, should be generally to the side of your seating position, maybe slightly behind. And the back speakers should be behind you, not too, not too far apart from each other. And the top speaker should be over there. And uh, maybe what I'll do as a way to save a little time, I'll go back to that diagram I had up. One, one thing that I see while you're pulling that up, one thing that I see all the time is, uh, you know, the couch is up against the back wall yep. and they want to do 7.1. And it's like, yep. you can't, you know, the, the rear speakers are supposed to be behind you, not on top of you. So you end up with four right. speakers, boom, 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 boom. And now it's all mudded back there and just sounds right. like a, sounds like a mush. Right. So it's it, it we I think we mentioned this before even it sometimes you know less is more so in a room like that where the couch is all the way up against the back wall five point one fine for that person five point one you may you actually you, you said it right Jason you may muddle things up more by trying to add back speakers right, right. so I'm going back to this room uh, that's got sort of an idealized layout I would say because we we uh, other than this little bump out it was a structural part of the space and we couldn't get around. Um, this is kind of where you want to put the speakers. It's actually, there's not that much sorcery to it. You know, the, the left and right speakers want to form a subtended angle of about 45 degrees to the seating position. They want to be at, you know, typically six to eight inches above your seated ear height. That sounds good. But they also want to be close to the middle of the screen. So if the screen is really far up and the speakers are low, you're going to hear the mouth speaking from like too low. If they're up too high, it's not going to image at the right place. And the bigger the screen, the bigger that change. Uh, or that difference between the sound and the picture is going to be. So typically somewhere between the middle of the screen and six or eight inches above your seated ear height works well. Um, the side speakers should form an angle to your seat of somewhere around 100 to 110 degrees, between 90 and 110 degrees. The back speakers, I usually don't find them to work well if they're spaced too far apart. Um, little known secret is I, I actually developed the original patent for Surround the X, did a lot That's of awesome. work on the back channel stuff and found so that cool. man, if those speakers are all the way out at 30 degrees from middle back, you actually can be confused and think that the sound's in front of you because your ears receive this, this angle at six plus and minus 30, which is 60, and it's interpreted by your brain as being in front of you. That's wrong. Right. So you really want them further back so that they, uh, I guess what I'm gonna say is relative to front center, if this is 90 degrees, and all the way back is 180 degrees, you want this at about 165 degrees. So there's a plus and minus 15. In this particular diagram, the back row has a net angle of 28 degrees. I don't know if you can see that. Right. Yeah, you can see it. So, yeah. um, so pretty close together. And actually, I find that offsetting them a little bit and kind of screwing up their correlation, either physically or by calibration, helps your brain not get confused that that's a correlated sound hitting you from behind, which is often interpreted in front. It's a strange effect in psychoacoustics called reversal. Um, psychoacoustics being the study of the, how the brain interprets the acoustical event when we share it. So, so avoid that. Um, top speakers are interesting. Um, in this particular room I'm showing here, with, I mean, this, the client went a really good immersion. We gave them six, six top speakers. The left group is at a halfway point between the center speaker and the left speaker, which you can see that right over here. And I wish I could turn on that drawing menu without, no, I, I know it won't work. Anyway, so this left group, which you see is at, a, at that halfway point, and the right group is at the halfway point between the center and the right. If you space them much wider than that, it, your brain starts to confuse them with the surround channel and it gets muddled. Mm -hmm. So keep, keep them sort of at that halfway point. Um, 
And the, the front row, I, the front group of speakers, I like to put, you know, in front of the, the front row of listeners, not directly overhead, because overhead doesn't actually sound so good. You really want it slightly in front. That's interpretive as being over, but, but uh, 15 to 20 degrees forward, which is two to three feet. Um, the, middle, the middle row over here, you'll notice, is still slightly forward of the, the back, this back row of seating. And the back is about 10 degrees back from behind. All right, so this diagram, I, I guess I would say, represents generally an idealized condition. Um, I, I'm not showing the heights of the speakers, and I forgot to do that here, sorry. The, these speakers here should actually be up 15 degrees from your seated ear height. I know that's a lot of math and trigonometry. It usually corresponds about two feet up from your seated ear height. Your seated ear height is typically about 40 inches off the floor in typical couches. So add 24 inches to that. Okay, same thing with the back speakers. Um, some people say that with immersive audio or uh, high definition audio, you want to lower the, no, that doesn't work very well. A side speaker coming, excuse me, side channel going directly into your ear canal, it's just going to distract you. You're going to be hearing the sound there. It's not going to give you good immersion. Okay, um, how are we doing on time here? Uh, we're about, we little time? yeah, we, I think we still have, I think we could still, still squeeze in a few more minutes. All right, uh, let's talk about um, this. While you're, while you're pulling that up, okay. Sam says, Anthony, could you please do an advanced room, teach, room treatment technique session? I really enjoy your down to earth approach. Uh, we're, we're gonna cover that, Sam, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, in the next few weeks, we'll, uh, we're, we've got a whole entire uh, session dedicated just to that, so stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, Nikolai says, hi, Jason and Anthony. With the acoustic placements, we have the wrong immersion experience for side seats. Ooh, I'm not sure what you're asking there. If you want to go ahead and maybe type it, type it in a different way, maybe. I, I think I'm, I may, might be misunderstanding your question. But yeah, uh, Anthony, uh, keep going ahead. And if Nikolai types that question in again, we'll come back to it. OK, so so far I've talked about placements of fronts, sides, backs, and tops. I know I did that extremely quickly. And I think, we, you know, if you guys are interested in this, actually, what would be really cool at the end of this is if you guys all type a, um, a feedback of, yeah, I'd love to learn more about this. Just like we just heard some, some totally. more time, like a whole hour spent on acoustics. I'm going to spend three minutes on it, on, on placement of yeah. treatments. Um, but, uh, yeah, please, please do give us feedback on what more you want to learn about. So sure. I'm going to talk about subwoofer placement in 10 seconds flat. Um, <laughs> Subwoofers are going to generate standing waves in rooms, and I, I have an entire three-hour session that I did for CDI and ISC that shows all of that. Um, you put one subwoofer in the room, it's almost impossible to get all of the seats. Like, you know, somebody was asking, but I want to, a, uh, Sanjeev was asking, I want to do a, an eight-seat theater. You can't make all eight seats have the same base with one subwoofer. I don't care how big it is, I don't care how much you tune it, it just won't work. The magic solution is four subwoofers in the room. And there we go. Uh, four subwoofers in the four corners works extremely well. And it's even better if you can tune them independently. So if you can actually feed them with individual level, delay, and, and frequency response control, that's even better. And you do that by either choosing a surround processor, such as the, you know, the upper end surround processors all have individual level delay and EQ for four subwoofer outputs if you do pretty expensive processors. Or you use uh, an equalizer. Uh, there's a bunch of different companies. I will give a, a shout out to the company called Mini DSP that for oh, incredibly excellent. cheap prices makes excellent. Very, very good and reliable products. You can get a, a product from them for, I'm going to say 150 bucks if I remember right, but it has two inputs and four outputs. You're just going to use one input and you're going to use four outputs to go to the four subwoofers and you can tune everything you want ad nauseum and get really even bass in the room. That's, in a, our that's world, a cool little piece. It's an amazing little piece. In our world of Romani systems, our, all of our subwoofer systems all have built-in EQ and level and delay, and you can tune them all to, to do exactly what I just said. Enough on that, because we're going to spend uh, an entire hour discussing this later. Just yep. know that two is better than one, four is better than two, more than four is actually not useful. Right. Don't believe me believe the people who have been studying this, the world's foremost expert in this is a guy called Dr. Todd Welty, who got his doctorate in subwoofer. Oh, wow. Um, That's he cool. spent years studying this, uh, and his doctoral thesis was actually on the interaction of uh, uh, transducers and rooms and standing waves, and he wrote amazing papers on that. There's a really, really good summary of it on the Harmon website. 
uh, download that. Uh, by the way, don't believe anything I said here. If you if you want the proof, I can send you the papers, or you can just go research it. You should do that for everybody. I could sit here and give you propaganda all day long, and <laughs> unless you trust me with everything, in which case I want your your credit card number right now, you can research and prove anything that these people are saying. Um, the science and the physics never changes. It doesn't always change. the same. Yeah. What does change is, is our understanding of it. So things right. that we used to believe in the past, suddenly somebody goes, you know what, I just figured out something new about that. That happens in all fields of science. You know, we used to think that our Earth was flat. Mm -hmm. And some guys tried to prove it was round. They poked out their eyes. It's still round. Somebody showed that it was round. Yeah. So science does evolve. And you don't want to poke fun at the earlier scientists. They, 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 we all do the best we can. All the scientists sure. do the best we can. There's just really cool new science in, in the world of small room acoustics like we're working. OK. Um, Next topic, really basic acoustics. This we're going to spend an entire hour on, but in the design of the acoustics of the room, you want to worry about the sound isolation. Ideally, a theater is one in which the sound, the noise from the outside world doesn't go in, so the room is really quiet. Mm -hmm. And it's also a room in which all the sound you do inside the theater doesn't leak out to the rest of the residence or, or wherever is around it. Uh, because that means you can't turn it up as loud as you want. It, it should be sound isolated, which means special wall construction, special floor construction, special ceiling construction that's all has a fair amount of mass and is decoupled, is, a, is actually not solidly anchored. Next thing you want to do is control the noise. So a video projector, amplifiers, anything that's making noise, uh, uh, ventilation, like this room is a pretty noisy air conditioner. Yeah, my AC and, too in this room is killer loud, crazy. Right. So that, that background noise is like keeping the lights on in a room with projection. You just can't hear, you just mm -hmm. can't see the low level detail. You can't hear the low level detail. It's all gone. Um, and so the background noise should be as low as, as 15 dB or what's called NC15. And that's a really quiet room. And in a room like that, you can actually turn the master volume down a little bit and end up with really good sound. And sure. finally, what I'm going to cover real quickly here is the reflections of sound in the room. So um, the, the reflections uh, are often only discussed in terms of decay times, so how long it takes for the, si the sound to bounce around the room before it decays. Um, but actually, there's more to it than that in a computer. There's how and where it bounces, uh, what axis it bounces from, where it's absorbed, where it's scattering. So let's go over that really quickly. So in three minutes, I'm going to try to cover two hours of material. So reflection decay time, how much treatment do we need? So um, let's. Let's go through this really quickly. Again, this is a diagram of a room with no treatments. If you just had a bare room that your client said, yep, this is what we're going to do. We're going to use all cheap rock everywhere. And this is what they're going to get. They're going to get a ton of reflections. Chaos is going to rain. It's going to be horrible. Mm -hmm. Dialogue and intelligibility is going to be poor. Um, this will not be an enjoyable place to watch a movie at. End of story. So you want to do something to treat that, to control that. And the, the something is, Judicious use of absorption or scattering devices. Absorbers are like sponges for sound. They turn the sound energy actually into heat. Scattering devices break up the sound. They, they take the main sound wave and break it into little pieces so that it energizes the room in a much smoother way. Is that kind of um, like a blowing up an asteroid? You know, there's an asteroid yeah. coming at us, so we nuke it. Yeah. All of a sudden, exactly. uh, little pieces. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So this would be a diagram of the decay of sound in the room starting with the original sound from the speaker, and then a bunch of pokes of sound that hit you. Every one of these are like, if you were, if this was a bed, that would be like sleeping on nails and studs, not comfortable. Your brain does not like this in a normal room of chaos. Ideally, this is what you want, is a really smooth decay through the room. So the sound, that, you do want to preserve some sound decaying in the room, but you want it to be distributed evenly so that your ear and brain have the same effect as sleeping on a really nice smooth bed. Um, now, you can do this by some absorption, but if you also add some scattering, you're going to end up, uh, you know, which is known as diffusers, you'll end up with a really smooth decay. And that's a room where you go, wow, it just sounds really sweet in here. Mm -hmm. It's not good to just talk in here, just a conversation is pleasant, but listening to speakers in a movie is, is really just engaging. I love it. So, now, it's a little bit of reflection. I'm sorry, if a lot of reflection is bad, why don't we just get rid of it all? Just just put fuzz everywhere. The fuzz is what acousticians call fiberglass. Let's just get rid of it all so we just have direct sound. That is bad. Do not do it. Do not over-absorb a room. Do not put fiberglass all the way around the room. Do not. I think I made my point pretty clearly. Now, why do not? 
Um, everybody knows, it's funny, I, I've been teaching these lectures for, like you said, about 30 years, maybe even more. I, I think I started the first one of these things maybe 38 years ago, I don't know. Um, but, you know, you ask people in a room, hey, you know, putting fiberglass everywhere, would that be bad? People go, yeah. Well, why is that bad? Because it's going to be too dead. So what? We want to hear the speakers. You know, it's like, isn't it good to just hear the speakers? Like, you know, in headphones, all you're hearing is a direct sound. There's no reflections. That can sound really good. Why, why is that wrong? Well, the human brain is used to hearing some amount of reflection in the room. And if you get rid of it all, the brain just goes, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Something's not right. Something's not right. Your brain's expecting some reflection. You can't get rid of it all. You need to keep some of it to support the speakers, do it in the right place, do it evenly, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So the guidelines are that ideally in most of the rooms we're working on, the decay time. So the time it takes for the sound to, after you put it in the room, for it to just die down to 60 decibels from where it was, it should be somewhere between 0.2 seconds for small rooms and 0.4 seconds for larger rooms. Um, interestingly enough, research was done on this. Um, as much as I think around 30 years ago, if I remember right, a bunch of researchers gave a bunch of listeners a bunch of music and a bunch of rooms and said, hey, do you like this or that better? And, and it ended up with some statistics that showed that most people like about the same range of decay with a very good statistical relevance, really tight curve. Um, there is an equation available both in the imperial system and the metric system here that shows what the target decay time should be given a certain room volume. So. What this says is, I'm gonna actually start with the metric system because it's a lot easier. If you're in a room that's 100 cubic meters, which is you know pretty normal sized room, normal sized living room, uh, you divide the volume of the room by 100, you take the cube root of that, which ends up with one, because the cube root of one is one, you multiply by 0.3 and that's your target decay time. That's how long the time should take to decay. So, See how easy it is in the metric system. That right there is what, why we should switch. Um, in, the, in the imperial system, a room that's around 22 feet long, somewhere 22 by 17 by something like 9 or 10, that would be 3,500 cubic feet. That would have the same result of about 0.3 seconds of decay time. So now how do you get there? You typically want in project studios and in, and in living rooms to have about 20 to 25% of decay time. This is a chart that shows, given a certain room uh, volume, or no, actually the volume that re reduced down to the square footage, how, how long the decay time should be. And it should be as even with frequency as possible. So some people treat their rooms with too thin of a material and it controls everything at the mid frequencies, but at low frequency, the, rever the reverb goes up. Ideally, the reflection decay time is the same at all frequencies. There is some tolerance. You can actually have twice as long of a decay time at low frequency and about half as long at high frequency without it detracting too much from the sound quality. Now, how do you figure out how many absorbers to put? I just told you what the target time is. I haven't told you how to get there. So the right way to do, to do it is to use the right amount. Uh, you do need to do a lot of math. You can either use this equation called the Sabine equation, which is from the 50s, or you can do this equation, which is from, I think, around the 50s, which is known as the I-ring equation. Um, and it's a little more complicated. Or you can use what's called the Arau Prashadas equation, which is from the 80s, from the Spanish researcher, uh, which is way more complicated. And you have to do all this math. And you can't. And you'd have to know a whole bunch of different things. Or you can just trust me. Uh, give me a quick second. The doorbell is ringing. I think I hear my, my kid crying outside. Oh, no, go ahead. Go right ahead. Jason, entertain them while I'm doing this. Yeah, while you, while Anthony, while you're checking on that, uh, there's a couple other questions that came in. Uh, one question I'm actually really curious to hear the answer to myself. Um, I think it was Joe said, um, yeah, Joe says uh, the importance of a reclined seat versus an unreclined seat. Uh, that position, you know, of your ears and, and head being back versus being forward. Uh, that's actually an excellent point. Um, I mean, I noticed myself in my two-channel system just moving my head forward, up, left, right, back a little. Uh, you know, if, whether I stand or sit, it's almost like um, it's almost like the equivalent in TVs when you're looking at an LCD screen. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, we were just uh, just discussing. Uh, Joe had mentioned uh, the importance of sitting straight up versus reclined. How that might change your perception mm. of the sound. And, yeah. and I noticed I'm kind of equating that to like an LCD screen, right? Even a small angle 
changes the black levels, changes the color saturation. Yeah. Uh, do you have any do you have any thoughts on that? Recline versus yeah. straight. Yeah, that's a two part uh, issue. So one one part is if your speakers have a really uneven dispersion vertically, a small change of head can have an enormous Huge. effect. Live right. sources can do that. Uh, speakers with with uh, ribbons, a lot of people are really fascinated with ribbons rather than faders. Right. But long vertical ribbons actually can have a really narrow dispersion. And if you go right below the edge or close to the bottom edge of the tweeter, you can end up with uh, with a, a complete loss of high frequency. So w one thing is if you're if you're choosing. Uh, you're, you're hearing my my technical assistant over there. Oh no, that's okay. The lovely really part of my dog clicking around her uh, food dish. So, <laughs> um, so uh, so if you have speakers with good vertical uh, coverage, the effect of going up and down won't change. That's one thing. Second thing, though, you can have changes of standing waves as you as you go up and down. But the uh, biggest thing is I'm uh, when we get to theater seats, the theater seats that recline fully, where you actually are all the way laying down. I'm giving you a demo. That doesn't sound so good, you know. When you're when you're all the way back and you're listening with grazing incidents from your body, it's just not so good. So I'm a big fan of chair of uh, seats that are called incliners, where just whatever recliners, incliners, things where where the backrest doesn't go all the way back, but when you're lifting up your legs, you get a little bit of tilt, but not too much. So that's a that's just in in order to avoid uh, too much of that effect. It, ultimately, people do however they want to do it. But, Anyway, getting back to this, you can run through all this map, and, and we do so, by the way, when we design theaters. We have this really complicated design tool that has this, this very powerful calculation engine, but in the end, if you cover about 15% of your wall surfaces, um, the earlier slide said 25, and that's actually for project studios. Sorry about that, I picked up the wrong slide, but in a home theater, around 15% of coverage of the walls with absorption, so imagine a two foot by two foot or a two foot by four foot panel and you look at the surface area of your walls you only cover 15 percent that's all you need to get to the right reflection decay time if you don't believe me please do the math you've got all the equations in the youtube uh, channel there are calculators out there you can download and you'll end up with the same results we've done this thousands of times it usually ends up there now it's also good to add some scattering so where you don't have absorbers Put some devices on the walls that break up the sound so it scatters around no more than 20%. I find that if a room is over diffused, there's other problems that start to show up. So I like to scatter, I like to uh, spread the absorbers eat pretty evenly around the room. Uh, there's an old legend about putting all the absorbers in the front and all the diffusers in the back called live ended, and that does not work right, especially in the world of immersive audio. It just really doesn't work right, but even in two channel. It's been long, long debunked. People still think that that's kind of a, a fun, a fun way to do a room. It's wrong. Just like some people think that the Earth is flat. And I heard there's actually uh, members of the Flat Earth Society all over the globe. Yeah. Oh yeah. They yeah. All They're all the over the globe. Yeah. Um, Bob yeah. asks real quick. Um, does that percentage change if you do some, um, some treatments on the ceiling? That 15 percent rule. Yep. So I like 15 percent of the left wall, the right wall. Excuse me. I'll just do it in my direction. Left wall, right wall, back wall, and ceiling. The front wall, you can put some absorption, but mainly base absorption. Um, you want to do a little bit of something on the floor, so at least uh, a nice thick area rug. Uh, but yeah, you should put stuff on the ceiling too, and that is coming up, I think, in the next slide. Good. So also treat the ceiling. So now let me show you some diagrams um, here. So this is a room that uh, I would say has an idealized condition for um, for how to spread the sounds, how to spread the absorbers and diffusers around. So I'll, I'll show you more details of this, but this is um, a room with a ratio of about 1.3 to 1. The left wall has an absorber here, an absorber here, an absorber there, not that many. The back wall has absorbers in the middle. The right wall has an absorber here, here, here. And then there's different types of diffusers. This is a diffuser that I'll call sometimes a hemi disc diffuser that's that takes the sound of the speakers and scatters it in two dimensions as a, as a plane. And this diagram shows a hemisphere diffuser that takes the sound of the speakers and scatters it hemispherically. I usually like to put these more towards the front and the hemispheres more towards the back. There's a lot of work in concert hall acoustics that says that's a good way to design it. I found in small rooms that also works really, really well. So let me show you what happens once you do that. Remember the diagrams I had before that showed all this chaos of reflected energy in all directions. If you do this, you absorb, you scatter, 
you absorb, you scatter, you absorb, you scatter, you absorb, you scatter. What you end up with is a room where there's still some reflected energy, but it's coming from all the way around you. It's scattered into smaller pieces and really even. Yeah. Right? That is right. If you take most people, uh, you drag them into a listening room that's treated like this and you play them music or film, they're going to go, wow, that sounds really good. It's really immersive. I feel like I'm in there. I, I hear the dialogue clearly. It's not over dead. It's not over live. It's really nice. Um, in the end, uh, you end up, with a, the experiential result is to have the sense of a good, clear arrival from the direction it, it's intended to, and then that you're surrounded by an even crescent of sound energy. That's just what works well. So. Um, the right recipe is 15% absorption, distributed ev evenly and to, to lower the reflected energy, not eliminated, about 20% of diffusion interleaved with the absorption uh, with uh, 2D towards the front and 3D towards the back. I want to be clear that these numbers, this does not refer to the mathematical dimension in a quadratic diffuser. This is just uh, dimensions in geometry and space. So this is a a plane, so it's a device that takes incident sound and scatters it on a plane, and this is a device that takes incident sound and scatters it in a hemisphere in three dimensions. Those improve spaciousness, improve the quality of the overall sound it's good. So, um, Bob had a follow-up question from the question earlier. Uh, he, he asked first if, um, if the percentage on the walls of acoustic treatment changes based on if you have stuff on the ceiling or not, and then his follow-up question was, if you don't put stuff on the ceiling, should you increase the amount on the walls? Uh, that's a good question. So, yeah, if if you, I mean, ideally you want a total surface area of treatment in the room to bring the reverb time down. Now, I'm I'm going to mention what's the wrong thing to do, which is if you find out, uh, actually, put that on hold one second. I'm going to show you yeah. some diagrams and it'll sure. just totally clarify this. So, sure. um, this is this, the, the acoustic recipe I just showed you, but I'm going to show you the individual wall. So this is the left wall. So if you look at this room, I'm pointing at the screen. You can't see that. Um, so this, this is the diff first diffuser, a hemi-disc diffuser on the left wall. I'm going to go to this diagram. That's that same diffuser. Okay. So this is our, our listening position. This room has an acoustically transparent screen with front speakers behind them. Um, Let's see. I see a, a diagram or something just popped up that says that my screen sharing just paused. Are you still seeing my screen? I can, yeah, I can still see it. I can still see it. I don't know what that was about. Anyway, so this is the first thing on this in this room is a diffuser. Then there's an absorber, diffuser, absorber, diffusers, absorber. Notice this whole left wall only has three absorbers. That if I just took those three absorbers and just put them into the back corner of the room, you'll see that compared to the total surface area of this room, that's less than 25%. Yeah, it's about much. 15%. It's not that much. When you put them up, it's like, wow, this is a lot of absorption. It's like, well, not really. It's not that much. Now, it is a fair amount of treatment because we're putting absorbers and diffusers and you see speakers and all that stuff. So let's say that you had a room in which you could only treat one wall and you took all of the absorbers that are supposed to be on the left wall and the right wall so this is our right wall layout. There's an absorber, diffusers, absorbers, diffusers, absorber, diffuser, absorber. And this is our, uh, here again, those four absorbers contribute to less than 25% surface area of that wall. And this is the back wall. Uh, we're going to put absorbers in the middle of the back wall to basically kill the front to back reflection. And then some, some uh, hemisphere diffusers on the outer side of that, maybe a little uh, heavy disc diffuser up above them. But let's say you had a room in which they said, nope, we got windows on the back wall, like it's all glass on the back wall, and it's all glass on the right wall. You're going to have to put all your treatment on the left wall. You can't put anything on the ceiling. Right? Do you, what do you do? Do you take all those absorbers from the right wall? Right. Remember, the, the client said, my right wall and my back wall are large uh, picture windows with a view on Miami Beach. I don't want to cover them. I want to watch a movie and I want to see the view. It's kind of going to go, are you watching the movie or are you seeing the view? Whatever. <laughs> um, do you take all those absorbers and put them all on the left wall? Do you actually take everything I just showed you and you cram them all onto this wall? So it'd be three from this wall, another four from the right wall, and another two from the left wall. Do you do that? 
My gut's telling me no. That's just my gut. Go. You have a good gut. It seems like it, it seems like you're it seems like you're doing too much work on just one side, and now the dispersion is going to be uneven. Yeah, so what, that's that, just what my instinct's saying. Right. So, so this is where acoustic stops and psychoacoustics starts, and it's 1:40, and I'm I'm still yakking. Sorry, mm -hmm. guys. I'm almost done. I promise. Um, <laughs> that's so, okay. We, we everybody's still hanging out. Really? Well, thank oh, yeah. you, guys. I'm I'm honored because this is this is a long time to be listening to uh, anything. <laughs> It's like the same length as a movie, man. Okay, anyway, so acoustics um, is a study of just the physics of how sound propagates. And you put all these absorbers all on one wall, theoretically, you will get the same reflection decay time. In practice, not true, but theoretically, as long as you put that same surface area of sponge, the energy is going to get sucked out. And that would be a calculation just based on math. In reality, what's going to happen in the psychoacoustics of how you're going to perceive this is the left wall is going to be all dead, the right wall is going to be all live, and your brain's going to go, what's up? What's going on yeah. here? It's not going to sound good. So if your client said, you can't put anything on the ceiling. Oh, I, I forgot the ceiling panel. So now we have three from the left wall, four from the right wall, two from the back wall, and two from the ceiling, right, yeah. from my diagram. You put them all there, it is not going to sound good. Totally dead left wall totally live right back and top it's not going to work so i i wouldn't do that um i i may instead of three panels on the left wall i may put five and just make that good enough end of story because it, it's not going to sound good and uh i'm glad you asked that question because it's a it's one of you know there's a lot of things in life where, where the rules uh the rules are not just one dimensional. You have to have a lot of consideration to it. And psychoacoustics, again, the perception, the brain's perception of acoustics is much more complicated than that. So, um, what we're looking for overall, again, is a is a layout of absorbers and diffusers that are evenly spread through the room, interleaved with each other, um, evenly laid out. I didn't mention that they're asymmetrically placed. I mentioned that I think on our last session. You may see it over here. You actually want the reflected field coming from the left wall to your ear to be slightly different than the reflected field from the right wall so that you can clearly tell that's not a correlated energy. It's, it has low interaural cross-correlation and that instead it's slightly scrambled, which tells your brain that's an unwanted reflected energy. You want this to happen. You want it to be evenly displayed and to get this result. Now, um, here's how that could look like laid out. This is from our sonatus line. Uh, this uh, that's the, the standard level. This is the premium level. In red, you have absorbers. In the grays, you have diffusers. In our high-end level, they're called Sonatus Ultra. You have absorbers here in blue, and the diffusers are actually not made out of wood. They're and there's a bunch of different colors. Um, you want to match the amount of coverage with the room. So if we look at our premium line in a in a package for a 350 square foot room. This is actually how many items are going to be in the room. It sounds like a lot. Just remember, this is only three absorbers on the left wall. It's not that many, or three pairs of absorbers. In a room that's 350 square feet, this would be the number of treatments. In a room that's 550 square feet, it's more treatments to maintain that 15% coverage. Okay? Um, so those are some of the ways to look at these things. Um, this is the website where you can go look uh, at more info on this. Uh, we also have another line called Sonata, enough of all this. Now, um, I, uh, this is a big room. This is like a 650 square foot room. This is how much oh, yeah. stuff you would put in there for the room to sound good. Now, I love this stuff, but it's ugly. Okay, it's ugly. So what you want to do when you design the room is work with the architect and designer to explain to them, we're going to put all this, this stuff on the walls, speakers and absorbers and diffusers and lights and wires, and we want to cover them all with stretched fabric. That's the right way to design a room. Right in the beginning, you want to have a conversation with the design police on the project and say, look, there's no way around it. You can't make a car without an engine. We're going to hide the engine under the hood. There needs to be an engine, whether it's uh, fuel powered or electric powered. We, we got to do that. We got to hide it. Great. You can't do a good home theater without all these speakers and treatments. We're going to hide them. This is an example of a room in which there is stretch fabric. Uh, when you walk in the room, it just looks like walls that are sort of a beigey, taupey color. Behind them are all this stuff. Okay. I kind of like seeing the panels myself. <laughs> yeah, you're a geek. <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge geek, though. Yeah. 
Um, so this is absorbers. These are diffusers, subwoofers, speakers. Um, the fact is that a room in which this is hidden is just more enjoyable. It's just less distracting and more, more palatable to the client. So um, stretch fabric walls can come in all shapes. So this is, I think this was a CD award winning room, if I remember right. Uh, they can look like this. They can look like this. They can look like that. They can look like this. They can look like that. They can look like this. All of these rooms have a layer of something acoustically porous that hides speakers and acoustic treatments and wires. Um, that's what you should do in the beginning. Every one of these rooms I quickly bounce through has a kind of a different aesthetic, different style. This particular room I just paused on is what we're doing a lot these days. I call these fun rooms. It's a room in which you can enjoy really good quality picture and sound, and you can also get up and go play uh, foosball, um, as it's known in the U.S., but in, in, in other countries. Um, or you can sit over here and play some cards, or you can go over here to the wine uh, bar and, and have a really nice bottle of wine. Anecdotally, I'll mention this. Uh, screen sharing paused again. So the back of this room is actually a really, really nice. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yeah, I don't know why that message comes up, Anthony. I can okay. still see your screen just fine. So I'm going to do a digression because I love wine. I love wine about as much as I love good audio, and the two work very well together. And my guest yes, friend, Dr. Cool, uh, <laughs> loves wine and audio too, which is why we love to hang out and talk about audio and drink really nice wine. Um, so at the back of this room is a wine cellar. So we actually did a, uh, and the wine cellar is actually visible through a, a glass window, which is covered by a drape when you're, when you're uh, uh, watching the movie. The, we did a perfect isolation to the wine uh, wine cellar so that there'd be no vibration from the room going into the bottles. And because uh, we wanted to make sure that the bottles were still and at right temperature and all that stuff. Well, it turns out that research shows that a slight amount of shaking and vibration on wine bottles helps them mature faster. Don't change the temperature too much, but but vibrate them a little bit. And really? this is very good research from top enologists that show oh. that you know just a little movement helps the whole process. So the the slow maturing process uh, go faster. And so whatever, after all the sound isolation, it turned out it wasn't uh, necessary. Anyway, now back to audio. A summary of this whole reflection decay business on, on acoustical treatments is the, the amount of it affects the character you're hearing. It can be predicted and measured. The treatments are absorption diffusion. Don't put too much of it. Cover only 15% of the walls with absorption. And there it is. Okay, final thing. Don't have time to get into it, otherwise this thing would become a full two hours and I'm committed to stopping it before that, <laughs> which is the final phase of, of a good theater is to, to tune it. And I'll just mention that tuning starts with debugging. A lot of people go into a room after they've hooked everything up and they start equalizing. They'll put a microphone in there and start doing the tuning. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Are you sure that all of the speakers are hooked up correctly? Are you sure that everything is in the right polarity? Are you sure that all the workers and video readers and tweeters and amplifiers, everything is working correctly? Um, so here's the bad news. Uh, after a thousand rooms, so we've been, uh, PMI, the company I started 20 years ago, has been contracted to design and take two construction and tune a thousand rooms. I have yet to find one where at calibration time, everything worked correctly. The wiring was correct, the speakers were correctly, the amplifiers were correctly. There was always some amount of repair needed before being able to calibrate. Same in video, by the way. Same. Hey, let's calibrate the TV. Uh, we're not getting HDR to it. Let's figure yeah. that out first. You know. Yeah, let's spend four hours trying to get HDR to work with all the source devices through all the switchers <laughs> under all the conditions. And it's going to take four hours. Right. Anybody who's saying it doesn't is either really lucky or is lying. Or, right. or is working with firmware that hasn't been updated because by the time you update it, it's all broken again. Yeah, sure, so, yeah, exactly. First step of calibration is test and debug everything. And I think maybe we'll do a session just on that. And then set the equalization. I'm still a fan of doing the measurement and equalization manually. There's some really good tools for very cheap. You can buy USB microphones you can buy from Arts Express. It only costs 70 or 80 bucks, work really well. There's a great measurement program called Room EQ Wizard that works really well. Uh, you can download it free. Please send the designer of it a $50 donation because it's well worth it. Um, and you equalize all the speakers. If you're doing it through one of the auto EQs, do still check using measurement that it that did a good job. Then you set the level, you set the time synchronization, and uh, the the uh, all of that should be done to the references of the film industry. And in the end, you want to use these tools, the one that's there and there bolted under your head to listen yeah. to it. The, the last phase of calibration is a four-hour listening session where you actually carefully go through 
all your reference materials and listen to everything and start tweaking little level changes, little delay, little EQ there until you're really happy with the result, but only after you've done all of the work with the proper tools. Um, you, it, it's, you're not allowed to start tweaking by ear until you've actually measured everything with proper measurement tools. Um, so um, anyway, all of this stuff should be done with proper engineering and design. Um, and we are available, if you're interested, my, um, my company called PMI Engineering can do the design work for you, produce plan sets that look like this, uh, 25, 30, 40 pages of all of the stuff. Um, we make a new generation of speakers called Gamani Systems. Uh, you can look at, at the website on gamani.tv. Uh, and I have two general lines of acoustical materials, one called MSR Acoustics and the, the Dimension 4 uh, franchise or uh, brand. Another one called Sonatus, which is a new brand we're bringing in from Europe that's really, really amazing for the price. You can look at all of that. You can email me at the email address over there. We'll be doing a bunch more of this if you guys want more of it. Yeah, gosh, thank you so much, Anthony. Lots and lots and lots to cover in a short amount of time. But uh, that's why we said we're going to do multiple sessions. And guys, we've got uh, different topics that we're going to talk about, uh, especially audio related with Anthony over the next few weeks. So, um, you know, stay in tune, uh, stay in touch, and uh, we will get um, we'll get you guys all educated up, man. These are tons of fun for me. I'm, I'm learning a lot myself, and I hope you guys are too. Uh, Anthony, you've got your uh, some some of your contact information up there on the screen. Let me grab the uh, presentation from you here, and I'm going to do the same. I'm going to show um, my screen over here. That way, we can see all of our contact information kind of at the same time. So, give me just a second. And oops, I'm in the wrong slide. Pardon me. Boom and boom. So here you go, guys. If you guys have any questions specifically for uh, Anthony or myself. Um, oh, why is that keep going to that screen? Sorry, give me just a moment. And boom, there we go. So uh, some of our information is on the left side of the screen there, guys. Uh, avperedge.com, radio.com, bullettrendcables.com. Again, you can live chat with our sales guys or tech support on any of those websites. Uh, phone numbers are on the left. If you have any specific questions, you can always email us at info at avperedge.com. My email address is jason at avprogloble.com. Anthony's information there is on the right side of the screen with all his different websites. So stay in tune, guys. Uh, we will be uh, doing, like I said, a series of these. Uh, I think we're going to probably do them on Mondays, most likely. But uh, you know, always uh, just stay in touch via the uh, the training um, calendar that's on the AV Pro Edge and Meridian Bullet Training websites. Uh, and then let me just take a peek over here real quick and see if there's any other last questions. Uh, Sandeep says, "Hi, Anthony. Um, do we know when you'll be updating the new webinar timings? Uh, that's actually my job, Sandeep. So stay tuned for that." Uh, we should have those dates and times up uh, hopefully by Wednesday this week. And that looks like that um, might be the end of the questions, guys. I'll go through the questions one more time this afternoon just in case we missed any. And if I did miss any, uh, we'll just reach out to you individually and, and get those questions answered for you. So with that being said, uh, Anthony, thank you so much for being here and, and all the time. I'm really excited to see uh, the rest of the sessions and some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Any, any final, final thoughts for the folks? Well, uh, Jason, first of all, big shout out to you and the team at AV Pro Edge. Again, you're doing this for the love of it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I just understand guys who are watching this, AV Pro Edge is not going to sell you anything out of all of this. You, you, I hope you guys understand it. They're doing this out of the, the, the kindness of their heart because they, they love this stuff. And so big shout out, you know, voluntary effort uh, on all parts. Um, Definitely. And uh, I just I just love it. Thanks. Thanks for putting this together. I want to thank all you guys for hanging with this for Almost two hours. Almost, it's yeah. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Time, to, time, time to get out and, and go on a long trip to your garage or to your basement or to your attic. T time to clean the attic. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Well, cool, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks again, Anthony. And uh, we'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. Okay. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye.